Welcome to this educational presentation regarding CERN and ependymal tumors. I'm pleased to be joined today by several CERN investigators. In this segment, I'd like to have a general dis discussion of ependymoma. Dr. Gilbert, would you like to start the conversation? Sure, thank you, Terry. I think it's very important that we talk about some of the fundamental aspects of ependymoma. The first is that it is considered a primary tumor of the nervous system. What I mean by primary is that it arises within the nervous system. There are other tumors and cancers that spread to the nervous system after developing in other organs, such as lung cancer, breast cancer, spreading to the central nervous system. Those are called secondary or metastatic, but ependymoma is a primary tumor of the nervous system. It can occur in the brain or in the spinal cord. And there are differences in the places that ependymomas develop based on age. So there is a difference between adult and pediatric. And what I'd like to do is to focus on some of the aspects in the adult ependymoma and then ask my colleague, Dr. Gajar, uh, to pick up and talk about the pediatric aspects of ependymoma. So ependymoma in adults is, is quite rare. We estimate that approximately 300 uh, patients a year are diagnosed with ependymoma in adult. The distribution of ependymoma in adults tends to be most commonly in the spinal cord, uh, where they tend to be uh, quite low grade or an intermediate grade, and only on rare occasions are they uh, malignant. And that's in distinction to the ependymoma that develop in the brain. In the adult brain, they tend to occur in the cerebrum, the large part of the brain, which is different than in the pediatrics, as Dr. Gajar will discuss, which is in a smaller aspect of the brain called the posterior fossa. Uh, I think it's important to know that um, there are distinct biologic differences between the tumors depending upon where they arise in the central nervous system. And one of the uh, major aspects of our research in CERN is to find critical components of these differences and to use them to come up with treatments that specifically target each of these tumors. I'd like to now ask Dr. Gujar uh, to talk about the pediatric aspects. So thank you, Mark. Uh, ependymoma in children is the third most common brain tumor after low-grade gliomas and medulloblastomas. We see about 2,000 newly diagnosed brain tumors in this country and about 200 ependymomas, uh, which accounts for about 10% of the total amount of brain tumors which are diagnosed in the United States. The tumor um, in children predominantly occurs at the back of the head or the posterior fossa. And the age range at which these tumors occur, there's a propensity for the, these tumors to occur in the younger children. There's a 10 to 15 percent of these children where the tumors occur in the large part of the brain or the supratentorial brain, and a relatively small percentage um, which occur in the spine, which is the different, as you mentioned, from the adult and the pediatric disease. Uh, there are different subtypes of ependymoma just based on the uh, histology, which uh, Ken will allude to as we go down in this discussion. And our patients predominantly are, because of their very young age, uh, really depend on the parents to pick up and diagnose these children because of their symptoms. One of the things I understand about these tumors is it's quite rare in adults. And one of the questions that people often ask are their risk factors, or is it something that um, can be hereditary? Can you all talk about that a bit as well? So um, ependymoma uh, is quite rare. As I mentioned, um, there are approximately 60,000 primary brain tumors diagnosed in adults in the United States in a year, and um, approximately 300 are ependymoma. So it's a very small percentage in, in distinction to the, to the pediatric experience. Um, it, it tends not to be hereditary. Um, with that small number, we have not been able to find any link to any um, occupational exposure, um, concerns about um, other uh, types of, of causative agents, certainly no link to smoking or um, any other environmental uh, pathogen that we've been able to discover. Is there anything different in pediatric patients regarding yeah, that, Dr. So Gajar? To date, we have not been able to find uh, any link, as Mark mentioned, or any heritable causes of uh, pandemoma. But, you know, research may change that answer once we know more about this disease. I would agree with that. Uh, I think we're finding um, very distinct patterns uh, of a pandemoma, and I know that uh, Dr. Gilbertson will, will talk about 
some of the, the fundamental laboratory research, which will probably give us a lot of those answers in the future. Yeah, and I, th I think an additional comment, which is interesting to what you said, Terry, is that one of the reasons why CERN works well as an interaction between pediatrics and adults is what's intriguing is if you look at the biology of those tumors, um, adult patients can have very similar, biologically speaking, tumors than children, depending on where in the brain they are in the nervous system. So that really gives us a, f a sort of backdrop on which to study both children and adults together. And I think that uh, it would be very interesting in, in a, another uh, segment um, to talk about how the biology varies by location um, and how it, we're, we're taking advantage of that to, to really work together to come up with common treatments. It sounds like CERN is really poised to answer some of those questions. I appreciate you all uh, being involved in this session and thank you very much.